Welcome everyone to the Wilmette Institute's webinar for September the 11th, 2022. Today we have a very special webinar because it's a panel of three presentations about human identity and development. Turning now to introduce our panel, we have three different speakers. First, we will hear from Jenny Menon Mariano, who's a developmental psychologist in Florida. She is not available to be present today, but she has recorded her presentation for us. She will be followed by Rhett Diesner, who has a degree in both degrees, both in psychology and in education. I knew him when he was at the Harvard School of Education as a graduate student. He has fantastic stories about his interactions with Kohlberg and various other well-known um, developmental psychologists. And then finally, we will have uh, Michael Penn, who is also a distinguished psychologist at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania and uh, author of a recent book. So I am much looking forward to hearing our panelists. After all three of them have presented, of course, we'll have a question and answer session. So without further ado, uh, I will now uh, turn off my camera and microphone and we'll turn the proceedings over to Jenny Menon Mariano's presentation. Hi there, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you at the Wilma Institute. I wanna thank Rob Stockman very much. My name is Jenny Mariano and I am an educational psychologist and I teach at the University of South Florida. At USF, I have been studying the topic of purpose in life and its development, particularly during the period of youth. And I've been doing that for over 20 years. So I thought it would be a good idea to share some of my thoughts and um, what I've learned about this very important topic over the last 20 years. Um, I hope that you will find it interesting. I think that the topic is of interest to all of us. So um, let me just share my screen. So purpose in life among youth. Often the first thing that we think of when we think of purpose in life from a Baha'i perspective is the short obligatory prayer. And this prayer says that, you know, the, it, it kind of lays out a purpose for us in some ways, right? It says that we bear witness that we were created to know and to love and to serve God. Um, and that we show that love and service and knowledge through our actions of service in our communities. Um, so, as I said, the prayer gives us a purpose. And, of course, there are other themes in the Baha'i writings that, that suggest what our purpose should be. Right. So um, to develop our virtues and skills so that we can be of service to all of humanity, um, so that we can contribute to an ever advancing civilization and so on. Um, the writings give us a clear purpose. And so our aspiration from that high perspective is to advance that purpose in our lives. Right. So that's that's one perspective. Um, and I think it's one that, that the high share. So let's look at that perspective um, from another angle. Let's say that we are working in a diverse community of beliefs and cultures, and we want to explore what purpose looks like, maybe in other religions, in other cultures, in other education systems, in other groups. If we want to look at purpose in this context, then the way we start as social science researchers is we usually start with why, by asking the question, what do we mean by purpose? And that leads us um, university researchers to defining the construct. That's often how, how we start. Um, and this way, if we define the construct and we work with other researchers to think about that construct and how to define it, that means we will all be on the same page as we go forward to conduct research and to also look at educational curricula together. Um, and that is where my work comes in. This is a definition that I've used in my research. There are other definitions, but they generally harmonize. Purpose is a long-term life aim that is at once personally meaningful and aimed at benefiting some aspect of the world beyond the self. So if we piece that up, we can understand that purpose is like a goal, but it's, it's much bigger than that, right? It's a long-term goal. Um, it's not like I need to go to the store today or drive my car somewhere. It's much more far-reaching. Uh, in some ways, I think of purpose as like a compass, a grand compass for our lives that, that moves us in a cer certain direction. 
it can organize and it can direct our goals, um, our higher goals. It's also really important to us. It's personally meaningful and it can be a great source of personal meaning if we think about what is our purpose in life, right? So researchers like myself do look at purpose somewhat differently, but like I said, there's harmony. Researchers like myself are increasingly interested in a particular type of purpose that some people develop. And I've circled that there. So for example, if we look at this definition again, you can look at the definition and it says, there's this aspect of positively impacting the world beyond self. So researchers use different terms for this idea of beyond self. For example, some call it beyond the self purpose, others call it noble purpose or moral purpose or pro-social purpose or other oriented purpose. And you can call it whatever you want, but we're, we're basically trying to identify the same ideas. So at the self, we may ask ourselves, why is having a purpose important? On one perspective, it's obvious, right? It's intuitive. We're like, of course, it's good. It's perfect. It's it's a it's important. Purpose is noble. We should do noble things, and that is the whole point of our our lives. There's something intrinsic there. Who would argue against that, right? Um, and then from a social science perspective, my social science mind says, well, let's look at that assumption from another point of view. So social scientists ask, let's look for evidence to understand how purpose might facilitate human thriving and what is good. So by knowing this um, and the ways that this happens, we can really learn a lot more than we would have if we just you know, accept that this is our purpose. Because we can now figure out how do we go from here where I am to what I think my purpose should be. What is that journey in between? And when I look at that in my research, I look at youth particular in particular. So we interview and we survey young people a lot about these questions. So if you look at this slide, um, some of you might be familiar with the junior youth program materials. And in these materials, they talk about a twofold no noble purpose, which you've seen in some other secondary high writings as well. Um, and uh, so the idea is that one's purpose in life is to work on developing one's highest, best self or your skills or your virtues. And at the same time, you're finding ways to serve humanity. So it's pretty global because that, that could look different for everybody, right? But the basic guideline is there. And the basic principle is that these, I, these two, they work together. And if you look at the definition that social, social scientists are using and this idea of twofold moral purpose, they're definitely not at odds. I think that there's some harmony there and there's something to work from there that um, is the same, right? So, so, so far in some, I'll just say by using these definitions of beyond the self or noble purpose, what I do is I look at how purpose is experienced in different places, and across groups, I also look at where is purpose useful and where and how might it be harmful? That's even possible, right? I also look at what fosters purpose and how people develop purposes that help them in their communities. And that in a nutshell is my research. So let me share with you some of the findings that are emerging from the last 20 something years of research on purpose among you. So this image is a summary of some of the things that researchers have found to be positively associated with having a sense of purpose during adolescence or young adulthood. As I said, often they give young people surveys or, or interviews, researchers, we do, and we ask them about their purposes. And then we see if those who have a strong sense of purpose are more likely to have other outcomes and whether they're acting on their purposes and they're you know, um, committed to those purposes and, and you know, all, all these kinds of questions. And so take a look at some of these things, identity, positivity, gratitude, humility, meaning, compassion, self-control, a lot of interesting life satisfaction, a lot, these are the, some of the interesting correlates of purpose. And what this basically means that it, you know, young people who have purpose um, may be more likely to have more of these or vice versa, okay? These some um, strengths or outcomes. So now that we are learning that po purpose is positive, um, how, and it can help us as educators, right? How can this be the case? How can we foster purpose? 
So doing more research on this was really illuminating some ideas about how we might be able to do this. So research has shown that having a purpose in life expands our sense of who is in our community. That's another piece of information that comes from this research. And it actually makes us more inclusive. So let me share examples of this specific study that I'm invoking here. Okay, so take a look at this. Imagine you go into an environment where people are really different from you. Let's say the subway, okay? They may look different from you. Um, they may come from a different place or may behave differently in some ways because they come from a different culture. Okay, so imagine that we've all been in those circumstances. Now, it's not uncommon under those circumstances for some of us to feel uncomfortable, right? That would be pretty human. So a couple of researchers picked up on this idea, um, Tony Burrow and Patrick Hill. And in one st study, they decided to, to send undergraduate students onto subway trains. And they selected them in such a way where they would go onto trains where these people would, would feel like they were people who were different from them. And therefore, they might be more likely to feel less comfortable. Okay. Um, furthermore, think about it. You're on a train. You're in an urban environment. Maybe you're not from the city. Um, you're in close proximity in this urban environment um, to others. Um, you may be more on guard in your surroundings, um, especially if you're coming from elsewhere. Okay. So they send them onto these trains. But before they do that, they have them write about their purposes in life, right? They have some of them write about their purposes in life. And they send them onto their trains. And then they, they look at the responses on the surveys and um, writing prompts and that kind of thing that they gave them. And what did they find? They found that those who wrote about their purposes experienced less negative feelings than those who did not write about their purposes. So for example, they experienced less fear and discomfort. So this shows us how purpose may guard us against negative experiences and create a sense of resilience. And it can make us resilient under these stressful situations. And it's possible, you know, we're thinking that by opening your heart and your mind to something greater than yourself, on focusing on something greater than yourself, perhaps purpose can bring us closer to others too. So it seems that even having individuals write about their purpose can help do this. So this is an example of how research is showing us how we might foster a sense of purpose and how that purpose could lead to positive social and personal outcomes. So just by reflecting and thinking about purpose, which we don't often do, right, in our educational systems. Um, we might not even do that at home, and young people don't often do it. So just by doing that simple thing, we can find that, that that's a possibility. So. Um, reflection on our purpose brings real personal and social benefits is what we established from a growing body of work that shows this theme. So we know that purpose needs to be studied to be useful for us in application. So as a researcher, I just never assume anything about what I know about purpose, right? Even though I've studied it. Um, even though I have a sense of what my purpose should be. I find ways to ask important questions, and then I come up with ways to investigate them systematically. And it's really an ongoing journey, and there are so many questions to ask. I'm over 20 years in. I don't think that's ever going to stop, right? Um, so I ask questions. However, I will say that there are some interesting guidelines in the Baha'i writings that have really inspired me in terms of pointing me in the direction of asking certain questions over others. So one is the idea of not just fostering any purpose, but fostering beyond the self, a noble purpose. What does that look like? And looking at that, that's one thing. Um, another way that the Baha'i writings have kind of inspired me in this direction is by offering this idea of maturity. So for example, the Baha'i writings talk about maturity as a feature of both an individual human being as they grow into adulthood and become spiritually mature. And um, the writings also give us this, this collective concept of maturity, uh, the idea of all of humanity growing into spiritual maturity. So these ideas have helped me connect um, in my own research program on purpose. So you'll see um, the short obligatory prayer, for example, is required from age 15. It's not required at age five. It's not a requirement that starts at age 50, it's at age 15. So we wonder why. Um, and there are many examples in the Baha'i context 
that show that humans develop over time and at different times, um, some things may be more appropriate than others, right? So if you say you wanted to in, uh, introduce an educational activity that fosters purpose, at what age would you do that? Would it look different at certain ages than other ages? And these are the questions you start asking as both an educator and, and a researcher and as a Baha'i who is inspired um, by all three of these sources of knowledge that I'm in questioning that I'm, that I'm talking about, right? So let me share this thought age of maturity, if we look at um, the research on human development that has to do with purpose, actually people have thought about this for thousands of years, right? Philosophers, uh, psychologists, um, thinkers, religionists, like this is not a new thing. We have, it, it seems to be a universal phenomenon to seek a purpose in life. And when we don't find a purpose or don't seek a purpose, then all sorts of you know, it's not good, right? We're not happy. We're not thriving. Um, so it's human nature to do this. And in research on human development, particularly a focus on purpose comes to their forefront with the work of Eric Erickson. And even earlier on in the 20th century, we see this in the work of someone named Viktor Frankl. I won't go into that. Um, but Erickson was one of the developmental psychologists who talked about how human, the human being begins to develop differently at different life stages. And that the human being has different developmental needs at different life stages. And Erickson said that during adolescence, a key task is to develop a sense of identity. And along with that may come development of purpose. And that's because um, young people, are poised, many young people are poised to start asking, who am I, what do I want to be? Um, this is an opportune period for development of purpose. So what we're gonna do now is look at, I'm gonna show you what purpose looks like in adolescence. So some people are asking these questions about purpose, they're seeking purpose, they're ready to seek purpose, some are not finding purpose. There's some diversity there. It's really interesting to see what we find in the research on this topic. So. Um, in one of the very first um, studies of youth purpose, uh, my colleagues and I interviewed young people across the United States, and these were adolescents from a range of ages and from different places, and we looked at the interviews, um, and by looking at the responses from the young people, we were able to categorize these young people in terms of their statements and what they were saying about their purpose. Um, so what we found is generally found four groups, like at the very bottom, we found, you know, young, some young people weren't able to articulate a purpose at all. Often those were younger students, although um, sometimes it was older students, right? Um, and then some were clearly voicing aspirations. We call these dreamers, yeah. right? Very clear dreams of this is what I'd like to do. This is, some of these are really beyond the self dreams too. They wanted to do great things, but they hadn't really connected that to anything fundamental or practical in their own lives or their own future plans. And still we found that some young people beyond this, they had very clear purpose. They were acting on their purpose, very clear future plans and they were moving ahead. Um, and they were quite certain about their purposes. Now among these, this group that had clear purposes, some were primarily focused on their own personal success or well-being or developing that best aspect of themselves right? Their skills and, and future and knowledge and this kind of thing. But there was a group that was able to really talk about developing their own skills and also being of service to humanity, doing something beyond themselves, serving other people. And it's that piece that we call um, beyond the self-purpose. So let's go um, back to this. Um, this is really what we mean by beyond the self purpose, right? Like this is kind of the stuff that I look at in my in my own research. And when we found that, you know, when we started talking about beyond the self purpose, it kind of got me curious about what that actually looks like. So I wonder, for example, whether having a beyond the self purpose affects individuals' virtues. Um, are there different types of beyond the self purpose? Um, and some of the the research on this, you know, gives us some hints. So if you take a look back at our concept of twofold noble purpose, right? Or, or moral purpose that I spoke about. 
this is an interesting concept because um, this concept suggests that, as I mentioned before, people are developing their skills, their best selves, and there's actually no conflict between that and serving humanity or serving others or going beyond the self. There is no conflict. And so that's why that arrow there shows like a bi-directional relationship, we say, in social science. One affects the other. Um, it's not one or the other, okay? Um, so I started asking these questions in my own research. Particularly, are there different types of beyond the self purpose? And it does occur to me that not all purposes are going to be as um, contemporary or as particularly suited to the needs of humanity today. Um, we really need individuals with purposes that are, are far reaching. So for example, when we talk about a consciousness of the oneness of humanity, what does that even mean, right? And when we talk about a purpose, what does that mean? So I'm starting to explore this in slowly in my own research. Um, one of the questions I'm asking in, in a paper that I recently wrote, for example, is, is there a global purpose schema? A schema is a way of thinking. In other words, are there young people out there who think in certain ways um, and are they different than others? And does that affect their action? Um, do some of these individuals direct their purposes not to nearby others, but to far away others, maybe those they don't even know? Do they feel closer to those individuals? Do they include them in their circle of we? right, of, of, of self versus um, these are others who are not like me. And so I started asking these questions, do some purposes include concern for all of humanity? And if so, what are the, what are some of the implications of such purposes? And gathering, you know, slowly gathering some information about that. So for example, um, in a six country study with young people, my colleagues and I asked young people to write about their purposes in life. And we did find that some of the highly purposeful youth also had global concerns, such as for issues that affect all of humanity and require global solutions. Um, and we found that in their speech, right? So for example, we found individuals in China and Finland and Korea and the US and Spain, they, they, they had these global tags in their language, some of them, right? Like some one person in China, for example, said they wanted to be a good teacher and they wanted to be a teacher, why? So that they could teach children so they could help them live peaceful lives in a changing world, right? So there's this awareness that, that these young people are, and, and those they are serving are embedded in a larger, larger context. And then in another study that was done um, by my colleagues, students with beyond the self purpose said things like this too. Like for example, one adolescent said that they plan to create apps and devices with like-minded peers so that they could raise awareness about social and environmental issues and to spread knowledge about the world, right? And so these are the kinds of kinds of thinking or kinds of um, words and verbiage narrative that is coming out of these um, young people's um, statements. Another said, I've always wanted to use my writing to speak up and support the people in the world that have less than me, right? So, so you see this, this evidence of, um, of thinking in some young people. And so it does seem that beyond the self-purpose expands some individuals um, thinking to service to those who are far away from themselves. So for example, some young people with beyond the self-purpose primarily talk about their families and that is normal, right? It, it, it's to be expected. Um, but others include their families as well as others. So if we go back again to this twofold noble purpose idea, um, re recall again that the first part is that you're developing your skills and best selves, self, right, in service. So the other question that came up for me is, well, what does that mean, your best self? Another way of looking at your best self is your development of your virtues. And so it made me wonder, um, what does it look like when young people have beyond the self purposes and does a sense of beyond the self purpose have any benefit for growing our virtues in any way? That's a huge question, um, but it's a good one, right? It's a really interesting one that a few studies have started looking at. So um, let me share with you results of one study. So for example, um, in one study, researchers interviewed adolescents again about their purpose. 
but they also asked how they experienced specific virtues. And they particularly asked about gratitude and compassion. And they discovered that youth beyond the self noble purpose express these quite differently than their less purposeful peers. So for example, their sense of compassion was much more far reaching. It extended to wider groups of people beyond their immediate environment. It was less conditional. Um, both compassion and gratitude were expressed by these young people in more universal terms. And their gratitude was also less conditional. Um, so for example, let me share some examples. Um, an example of compassion examples for a beyond the self purpose student. Um, the student said that we should just help each other because we're humans, we depend on each other. Um, this person, another said, I try to be compassionate towards everyone if, if I see somebody in need of help because everyone deserves that. Whereas those with sub threshold types of purpose or who didn't have a high prevalence of purpose in, the, in their speech, they also talked about compassion and they also showed compassion, like expressed that compassion is important. But they said things like, you know, why do you want to be compassionate? Well, because um, it's not, you know, I feel like others will help me out too if I'm compassionate, right? So it's conditional. Um, and there's also a sense of, you know, I'd like to be compassionate to more people, but I'm just a young person, so I just do what I can, right? And then the examples of gratitude were also similar. So those with beyond the self-purpose said things like, um, you know, I am so lucky to have a life. Um, and just refer to, to, to kind of higher order things like that. Whereas um, those with some threshold purpose said things like, you know, I'm thankful to my parents or this person to that person, but they didn't express more, you know, thankfulness to something greater than themselves. Anyway, so these are just some ideas that I'd like to, I'm glad that I was able to share with you about my research on purpose in life among youth. Thank you for sharing, for allowing me to share this with you. And as you may conclude from my, con my, from my talk, so in a Baha'i context, we see our purpose in light of knowing, loving, and serving God. In academic terms, we are building the basis for useful and pragmatic ways that purpose can benefit individuals in our communities. And the way I have conducted my research and others are doing that is one way of doing that. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful presentation from Dr. Amen and Mariano. I think we should all give her a little applause even if we can't see each other. Very interesting and segue somewhat into uh, my presentation, which is looking at uh, the human virtues, which, as she mentioned, have much to do with purpose. And <clears throat> as you can see from this slide, uh, the topic is the inner beauty of human being, our ontology. I'd like to begin by <clears throat> centering ourselves with a, a one-minute music me uh, meditation. Uh, the music I've selected is composed by William Grant Still, who at one time was the most popular American symphonic composer for a couple of decades. And he has one particular uh, piece that relates to uh, this presentation. Uh, he named it Summerland. And he referred to it as a portrait of the promised beauty in the afterlife. Uh, so this is our, our theme, uh, the beauty of human being. And so I'd like us to take a couple of deep breaths and sink into the first minute of this piece of music.
Oh, I hope that felt as beautiful to you as it did to me. And I encourage you to look up more of his works. He has some great symphonies. <clears throat> of course, if we pause for a moment and think, what is the most beautiful being in the universe? I believe we'll have an instant intuition, which is God is the most beautiful being. And if God is the most beautiful being, then obviously the most beautiful being in this world is the universal manifestation of God which we might call the blessed beauty or the ancient beauty or the glorious beauty or the most great beauty. Here we have some scripture from Genesis. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. <clears throat> the blessed beauty, Jamala Mubarak, manifestation of God for this age, in his hidden words revealed, veiled in my immemorial being and in the ancient eternity of my essence, I knew my love for thee, therefore I created thee, have engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. <clears throat> Abdu'l-Baha, of course, has also written on a similar theme here from a selections of writings, Abdu'l-Baha, he wrote, in the sight of Baha, women are accounted the same as men, and God hath created all humankind in his own image and after his own likeness. That is, men and women alike are the revealers of his names and attributes. And from the spiritual viewpoint, there is no difference between them. We come upon a little bit of a logical problem, however, because it is not possible for humans to be in God's likeness nor image. Baha'u'llah wrote in Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, God in his essence and his own self hath ever been unseen, inaccessible, and unknowable. He moreover hath never had, nor hath he any peer or likeness. In prayers and meditations, thou hast verily been at all times and will everlastingly continue to remain immensely exalted beyond and above all comparison and likeness, above all imagination of parity or resemblance. And cause us then to acknowledge thee as one who is exalted above every comparison and is holy beyond all likeness and will lift up our voices amongst thy servants and cry aloud that he is the one God, the incomparable, the ever-abiding, the most powerful, the all-glorious, the all-wise. <clears throat> so, what is a possible solution to this? We're created in God's image, but God cannot possibly have any likeness. Well, the obvious solution is humans are created in the image of the manifestation of God. Let's be cautious. Baha'u'llah observes that, quote, the soul is a sign of God, a heavenly gem, whose reality the most learned of men have failed to grasp and whose mystery no mind, however acute, can ever hope to unravel. With this cautionary observation in mind, we will proceed with care, realizing that any effort we make to discuss the reality of the human soul will necessarily be inadequate and incomplete. <clears throat> Of 
Abdul Baha has described the soul as simple. In this case, simple means there's no elements, no composition, no parts. Abdul Baha in Paris Talks may have said something like scientific philosophy has demonstrated that a simple element, simple meaning not composed, is indestructible, eternal. The soul, not being a composition of elements, is, in character, as a simple element, and therefore cannot cease to exist. The soul, being of that one indivisible substance, can suffer neither disintegration nor destruction. Therefore, there is no reason for its coming to an end. <clears throat> Likewise, in Abdul Baha's talks that are recorded in Promulgation of Universal Peace, Quote, therefore, it is evident that life is the expression of composition and mortality, or death, is equivalent to decomposition. As the spirit of man is not composed of material elements, it is not subject to decomposition and therefore has no death. It is self-evident that the human spirit is simple, single, and not composed in order that it may come to immortality. So, <clears throat> despite the soul being simple, uncomposed, doesn't have parts, doesn't have elements, which in a sense would imply that it doesn't have attributes, Baha'u'llah said, upon the inmost reality of each and every created thing, he has said the light of one of his names and made it a recipient of the glory of one of his attributes. Upon the reality of man, however, he had focused the radiance of all his names and attributes and made it a mirror of his own self. So is this mirror the simple, uncomposed soul? Are the attributes of the manifestation of God reflected in this mirror? We realize that God does not have direct intercourse with creation, it is some form of emanation from God. However, through the manifestation of God, perhaps the manifestation of God is that conduit who shines the light of these attributes upon us. The attributes of God and thus the attributes of the manifestation of God are beautiful. These attributes of the manifestation of God that are reflected in the human mirror may be called the human virtues. In the field of psychology, they're often called character strengths and are considered to be moral beauty. Uh, Aristotle has a very interesting take on the virtues and beauty. In fact, he can be interpreted to say that the goal of all virtues is to create beauty. Aristotle considered beauty as an ultimate virtue, the virtue to which all other virtues aim. That is the purpose, in Greek, telos. You can see we could relate this to Dr. Men and Mariano's talk, because now we're thinking about purpose. The purpose of the virtues such as courage and justice, is beauty. Let's, let's take a brief interlude to center ourselves with a beautiful poem written by Giulio Savi, the great Italian scholar and poet. And he has translated this poem himself into English. He entitled it, The Swans of Bowden Z. He wrote it in 1998, and he dedicated it to the students and teachers at the Baha'i Land Egg Academy. In aura of snow-white beauty, they glide together unruffled on the lake. They look ahead, wreathed in smiles. They keep silence. And in their silence, they say a thousand and one words. What do they say? love and beauty. 
Whence do they come? From the meadows of love. Where's their home? In a nest of rapture. Where are they going? In search of lovers of the blessed beauty. Now it appears the soul and body interact through the medium of the mind. In a letter written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi, we have three aspects of our humanness, so to speak, a body, a mind, and an immortal identity, soul or spirit. We believe the mind forms a link between the soul and the body, and the two interact on each other. So it appears we have some chain of being in which the attributes of God shine on to the soul of the manifestation of God. And the manifestation of God then shines upon the mirror of the human soul, these attributes and virtues. And then perhaps through the medium of the mind, the soul shines these beautiful attributes into the human brain and body. The attributes and virtues of God emanate from God to this mirror of the human soul, are then reflected from the soul to the brain via the mind, and then from brain to behavior. And then there may be a feedback loop from behavior to brain to mind to soul. I remind you of the earlier quotation, we believe the mind forms a link between the soul and the body, and the two interact with each other. Now, I'd like to take you on a little tour of neuropsychological research and uh, look at this study that came out in Cerebral Cortex in 2009, Your Brain on Gratitude. I'm not totally sure that gratitude is one of the attributes of God, but it certainly is one of the attributes of the manifestation of God. When the manifestation of God turns towards God, their heart is full of gratitude. And this is a role model for us. So when Zahn used functional magnetic resonant imaging to examine neural correlates of gratitude, they determined that the neural firing pattern associated with the virtue of gratitude involved the coactivation of three areas of the brain the superior anterior temporal lobe, the mesolimbic region, and the basal forebrain. Compassion is near and dear to my heart. And this is our brain on compassion. Again, using fMRI, Mary Helen Imudino Yang investigated with a team, investigated the neural firing patterns associated with compassion for those suffering psychosocial or physical pain. And they also looked at admiration of virtue. They reported compassion as firing in the posterior medial cortices, which are involved in self-related consciousness processes. They also found that the anterior insula showed a distinct pattern of firing shared by both admiration of virtue and compassion for psychosocial suffering. We know justice is the most beloved of all things in the sight of God, and this might describe our brain on justice. Mole and others using, again, fMRI, explored the human natural sense of fairness. And they determined that a particular pattern of neural firing in the orbital and medial sectors of the prefrontal cortex and the superior temporal sulcus region, which are critical regions for social behavior and perception, play a central role in moral appraisals related to fairness. Baha'u'llah also emphasized the tremendous support, importance of trustworthiness and a team in Italy 
headed by Julia Matavele and her colleagues used fMRI to investigate neural responses to trustworthiness in the amygdala and face selective regions in the occipital and temporal lobes. Their results indicated that the brain has a specific pattern of firing when determining someone's trustworthiness. <clears throat> so those were a little taste for us. Brain science is very much in its infancy. The truth is all of science is very much in its infancy, <laughs> but brain science in particular. And the above slides give us a taste of how various virtues may appear when they're dancing on our brain's neurons. Perhaps those neural correlates are a sign of communication from the mirror of the soul through the mind and into the body. Now we can't talk about the inner nature of human beings without talking about love because maybe love is the most important, just period, the most important. Many philosophers, including Socrates and Plato, have stated that the object of all love is beauty. That is, when we love, it is beauty that we love. And when we love virtue, it is moral beauty that we love. This can be even on a crude level. If you say, I love potato chips, you're talking about the gustatory beauty of potato chips. If we talk about loving a person, it is their beauty that we love. And in the final analysis, it's their virtues, their moral beauty that we love. Empirical research findings also support this love by beauty connection. A study that I published with a few colleagues uh, back in 2013, showed a very strong correlation between love of all humanity and appreciation of beauty, and in particular, appreciation of moral beauty. People that notice the virtues in others, people that notice the moral beauty of others, these people are lovers of all humankind, and vice versa. People that love all humanity, that are embodying the number one Baha'i principle of oneness of humanity, these are people that also notice the virtues in others. Here's a beautiful prayer. No surprise, I'm sure all of you know beautiful prayers. This prayer, however, was written by Rabia, a Islamic mystic, and she lived a long time ago. We're talking 1,200 years ago. Oh God, if I worship thee in fear of hell, burn me in hell. And if I worship thee in hope of paradise, exclude me from paradise. But if I worship thee for thine own sake, Withhold not thine everlasting beauty. <clears throat> this is the main part of my presentation. But I wanted to leave you with something a little bit practical that's also enjoyable. <clears throat> if you would like to explore <clears throat> your own moral beauty, or perhaps encourage one of your friends or lovers or family members, to explore their more beauty, encourage them to take the VIA test. This was the coolest personality test ever made. It has high reliability and validity. It's fairly well respected in the psychometric community. It's free to take, but if you go online to take it, they will try to sell you analyses of it. You don't need those. And if you're interested in your children or grandchildren taking the test, there is a, a version for eight to 17 year olds at the website. My family, uh, we all have taken it more than once. And then we post our top five, our top five strengths on our refrigerator. And it gives you a good way of looking deeper than skin deep about who a person is. If you wanna find it, 
It's pretty easy. Just simply Google via test and it'll be your first hit. If you're using a different uh, web browser than I do, uh, you could just uh, take the one that's associated with the VIA Institute on character. The people that designed this test, uh, actually, I think one of them, uh, Dr. Penn knows, uh, Martin Seligman helped design it. They recommend that <clears throat> you only focus on your top strengths, in particular, your top five, which are called your signature strengths. And those are the ones we post on our refrigerator because it, it profiles 24 different strengths. But they recommend just focusing on our top five. I think sort of like Al Baha said, you know, when somebody has 10 qualities, focus on their good quality. I have a really cool bonus slide here, which I think I have a minute left. <coughs> I just read a paper from one of Dr. Penn's uh, colleagues about music it was really fascinating. If you like reading peer-reviewed journal articles, I recommend you uh, look it up. But I just want to tell you something from its lit review because we, be we began with music, which is very important for the human soul. And so I just wanted to end with music. Abdul Baha says, the art of music is divine and effective. And in their research, in the literature review, when they're summarizing past research, they point out music can actually promote pro-social behavior. Engaging in musical activities makes people feel more connected, more helpful, and less prejudiced. These positive effects of music on social behavior appear across ages, they appear across diverse populations, and across a variety of musical activities. Shared musical experiences promote coordination and synchrony, Musical engagement enhances empathy in musicians, dancers, and listeners. And musicality is a character building virtue. So this is from their uh, literature review of their research. It isn't even actually the cool stuff they discovered themselves. This is just all stuff that has empirical support. And the reason I'm ending my talk about it is because music has some very magical things to do with the inner beauty of human being. And uh, that's my story. And now I'm eagerly looking forward to Dr. Penn's presentation. And uh, away we go. Professor Diesner, that was absolutely thrilling. Oh my God, so exciting. What a blessing to hear you again. Uh, you, you may know that Professor Diesner and I spent some time together in Switzerland, and uh, it was just such a joy to teach at his side. And now I'm reminded of, of the bounty associated with, uh, with his work and with his thinking and with his manner of presentation. So thank you so much. So all of us have been assuming that if life can be said to have a purpose, the purpose of life would appear to be development. And so when we're talking about um, human identity, we're talking about the, unfold, the unfoldment of capacities over time. One of the things that I'd like to talk with you a little bit about is some work that we're doing on the phenomenon of existential mattering. We're interested in the question, what might it mean for a human life to matter? What factors contribute to and also destroy the sense that one's life matters? And we're interested in that because we think that it is difficult to develop without the sense that one's, one's life matters. And I wanted to say a word about why that, is, why that is the case. In one of the very earliest writings of the, of the, of the, uh, the Baha'i teachings, there is uh, something told to the followers of the Bab. And he says to the follower, his followers that they should when a child comes into the world, recite or whisper in the child's ear the following verse. Verily, thou hast come by the command of God, hast been made manifest for his remembrance, and have been created for the service of him who is the Almighty, the well-beloved. And so the Bab is telling us from the outset that the child should be acquainted with the fact that 
there is indeed a purpose to life, that there is a purpose to their own particular life, and that they should pursue that purpose uh, over time. It's also a reminder of the parents that the precious life of the child needs ever to be kept in mind. And so in our thinking, we are um, trying to connect the challenge of existential mattering with the psychology of suffering. Uh, and I wanted to share with you some of the th things that we have been learning in the lab, in the clinic, and in the community on the relationship between suffering and the sense that our lives matter or the challenge of existential mattering. Stress, stress and suffering are paradoxical. They're paradoxical because they're necessary for development, but they can also make us angry or confused or hopeless and also ill. By suffering, what we mean is some kind of incongruence between our present state and some desired state. So we perceive our present condition and we imagine a condition that we could be in and this discrepancy between our present state and some desired state is what we're referring to here as a condition of suffering. And typically what happens is uh, faith and hopefulness, these states of consciousness, enable us to strive in such a manner as to close the distance between our present state and our desired state. And so one of the most important elements of a life of suffering is also a life of faith and a life of, of hopefulness. And faith and hopefulness keep within us the sense that our striving, that our work uh, will eventually lead us to um, uh, states that are more, uh, more desirable. This is a little image that I have created that give you a sense of um, the relationship between suffering and growth. Imagine that this image uh, is an image of, say, me, and uh, X represents everything that I am capable of at the present moment. If I want to develop, if I want my capacities to unfold, what I have to do is I have to experience something that is outside of my current uh, uh, ability to function, and I'm calling that area Y. In fact, Lev Vygotsky, a developmental psychologist, described why as the zone of proximal development. He said that's the area that we could develop into under the right conditions. But that area is an area uh, we have discovered of suffering, of doubt, and of difficulties. Whenever I experience something that is outside of my current capacity, outside of my current knowledge or my current ability to function, what happens is that stepping into that zone causes me to experience suffering. And I also then begin to doubt uh, my ability to function well. In other words, it's a period of growth in which the growth and the suffering are tightly intertwined or tightly connected to one another. And again, in that condition, we need to experience um, faith and hopefulness because they sustain us as we uh, try to traverse the distance between our current state and a desired state. Now, of course, from the Baha'i point of view, from the Baha'i perspective, this process of development is an eternal one. There's no time in which the process of development is arrested or stops, both in this world and in the world to come. But in this world, we play a very vital role. We play a very important role in the process of development. And if the process of development is going to be one that is successful, we have to continue to believe at all times in our potential for development. And in order to believe in our potential for development, our research is suggesting that we have to believe that our lives matter, that our suffering matters, that the difficulties that we are experiencing will somehow yield some kind of fruit or some kind of useful outcome. Part of the reason why we got interested in uh, this uh, work was our early interest, our early research on stress. Stress is sometimes used to describe a threatening situation, and other times it's used to describe a response to a situation. Lazarus articulated what's called the trans transactional model of stress, and he said the process of stress is triggered whenever stressors exceed a person's perceived personal 
and social resources. He went on to point out that a challenge is perceived when a situation is perceived to be demanding, but the individual perceives that they can see the meaning of what they are going through or think that they can somehow overcome and profit from the stressful situation. So the consciousness that we bring to stressful situations oftentimes determines how we function in those stressful situations. This is a model that we developed early to sort of try to describe what happens when we find ourselves under threat or under stress. So you can see that threat awakens in us anxiety and stress, and anxiety and stress expressed in their more primitive forms leads us to feeling anger or feeling fear. And we feel anger and fear when the perception of the sources of stress are perceived to be uncontrollable, unpredictable, unremitting, or mean meaningless, or unjust. Oftentimes, those perceptions lead to what we're calling a helplessness response, like depression, or demoralization, or anxiety-related dysfunctions. It can also lead to anger and hostility and a sense of dehumanization. At this point, though, we want to point out that stress puts pressure on us to abandon our values. Suffering renders us vulnerable to certain kinds of existential problems. We wonder, for example, about whether our life is worth it, whether the things that we are suffering are worth enduring. Now, on the other hand, when we experience something that is threatening to us, but we perceive that we could have some degree of control over the experience, or we perceive the meaningfulness of the experience, what happens is that the stress is transformed into a challenge. And when a stressful experience, a threatening experience is transformed into a challenge, we mobilize our coping response. We mobilize our psychological, social, and spiritual resources to face that challenge, to face that threat. And for that reason, our uh, resources develop. So this is how exposure to threat, exposure to difficulty, this is a model of how exposure to threat and difficulty can somehow drive human, human development. We had initially become interested in this work because of the time that I had spent uh, around and in the laboratories of Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman was, uh, uh, at the time that I was uh, working, uh, uh, the, the time that I was at the University of Pennsylvania, he was one of the, the most successful experimental psychopathologists. And experimental psychopathologists try to create in the laboratory, oftentimes using animals, conditions that mimic the, devel uh, the development of diseases and disabilities in human beings. And that early work, Martin Seligman was working with something called the triadic design. And in the triadic design, um, it's a very sort of simple model in which we have three conditions. Imagine that we have three rooms, room A, room B, and room C. And uh, we can put a, a dog, an, an animal, we were using at that time mongrel dogs, you can put a dog in uh, condition A, in room A, in room B, in room C. Rooms A and B are connected to one another, and so we say that they are yoked. On the ground of the rooms A and B, it is possible to make that ground um, uh, experience a kind of an electric current. The electric current is uncomfortable, but it's not life-threatening. It's, it, it's obnoxious. The animal doesn't like it, but it doesn't threaten the life of the animal. I should also point out that this research is not done anymore. Um, but this is some of the early research that led us to thinking about the, the relationship between stress a development and also illness. Notice that the animal who is in condition A has a yellow oval in its, in its room. That yellow oval controls the shock for the animal in condition A and the animal in condition B. So there is a light in the room and when the light flashes, the ground will become electrified for the animals in condition A and B and they quite naturally start to run around to try to figure out how to escape or how to turn off the shock. When the animal in condition A uh, hits that yellow oval initially by accident or by chance, the shock will go off for the animal in condition B as well. So they experience exactly the same amount of shock for exactly the same amount of time. The only difference is that the 
the animal in condition B is in an uncontrollable condition. In other words, no matter what that animal does, the shock doesn't go off. The shock is entirely controlled by the animal in condition A. We say that the animal in condition B is exposed to uncontrollability because the probability of a successful outcome is independent of the animal's behavior. No matter what the animal does, it's going to experience shock until some other organism turns off the shock. And so we learned very early in that research that the perception of control over very stressful situations is necessary for organisms, and in this case, mongrel dogs, to um, use stressful experiences to drive forward their development. So for example, the animals that had been in condition A became very, very clever at solving problems that were necessary to turn off the shock. The animals in condition B, by contrast, tended to become very, very passive. They stopped thinking, they stopped processing information, they became sad. So the same physical experience led to different outcomes for dogs who had control over the experience as in contrast to dogs who had no control over the experience. When human beings are exposed to stressful um, experiences, to stressful situations, they are oftentimes asking questions about the situation. They, they want to know why they are in the situation that they are in. They are interested in the question, how much control do I have in the situation? What can I do about the situation? So humans want to make sense out of their suffering. They want their suffering to matter because when they believe that their suffering matters, they also believe that their lives matter. And so we were finding very, very early when we began to subject human beings to these kinds of situations where they were exposed to uncontrollable adversive events, they started to lose confidence, not only in themselves, but gradually over time, they started to lose confidence in life itself. They started to think, that life is just one damn thing after another. And they started to feel like their suffering, their hardship uh, didn't make any sense to them. And this oftentimes led um, um, uh, subjects or, or, or young people in our studies to become uh, depressed, even if they were participating in, in short-term laboratory studies. So we articulated a concept that we called existential mattering. And we defined existential mattering in this way. Existential mattering in the sense that is deployed in our research consists of the felt or phenomenological sense of one's own intrinsic value. This awareness is not only felt in an individual's own sense of self, but is extended to all humankind. We refer to this manifestation of mattering as either benign or altruistic and suggest that these forms of consciousness are revealed in the capacity and will to serve others, or may be manifested in the consciousness of one's role in self-transcendent socio-historical processes, or the perception of one's uniqueness in the vast universe, and or awareness of one's connection to a higher power or to that which is perceived to be sacred. In other words, when people have this form of existential mattering, they have a certain feeling about themselves, they have a feeling that their lives are of value, but they're also, they become other oriented. They become oriented towards being of service or of benefit to others. Now, in contrast to these positive forms of mattering, we also hypothesized in our work, the existence of a malignant form that we refer to in our research as malvolent or dark mattering. In this form, the sense that one matters is awakened and or sustained by narcissistic attitudes and assumptions by prejudice directed against outgroups who are assumed to be inferior and or by hostile attitudes towards life itself. In fact, we oftentimes found that people who had been exposed to brutal treatment, for example, in childhood and youth, began to develop very hostile attitudes, not only about themselves, but also towards other human beings and oftentimes towards life itself. John Bayer described malvolence as a contempt for the good that is personally deep. So the malvolent or dark forms of mattering thus tend to be destructive. 
So in our research, we were seeking to explore the implications of these various forms of mattering for people's social, behavioral, and mental health. Now, things matter to us to the extent that they are perceived to have value. And so we were connecting this work with some earlier work that we had done with Professor William S. Hatcher on the question, what is value? And as you know from that work, we had assumed that there are at least three kinds of value, what might be called functional value, what might be called extrinsic or socially constructed value, and what might be called intrinsic or inherent value. Functional value is the kind of value we build into things we make. What they do is functional value extends the reach of human capacities. So for example, if I build a telescope, it extends the reach of my vision. If I build a hammer, it empowers me to uh, exercise uh, the force of the body in ways that are not possible without the aid of a hammer. So functional value extends the reach of human capacities in some way. Then there is extrinsic value or socially constructed value, and this is symbolic value, historically situated. Cultures have to create value if they want to become, for example, complex. It's difficult to develop a complex civilization unless you can uh, impose upon uh, objects um, extrinsic or symbolic value. And then there is what we call intrinsic value, and that's the value that is associated with the identity of a thing, what a thing can do or what a thing can become. So for example, we use the, the example of the sun shining in the heavens as an example of intrinsic value. Um, the human person we suggest in this work is of intrinsic value. Uh, and the intrinsic value of a person is related to the capacities of the soul, the capacities of the human spirit that are desiring to come forth, that are desiring to manifest themselves in the world. And when a child is initially born into the world, the child is perhaps unaware of this value. It's relationships with others that gradually cultivate in us a consciousness of our value. And so in the early stages of our development, we, we start to get a sense that we are valuable because of the ways that our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers treat us. They convey to us the sense that we are of value. And so we come to value our own selves. In this work, we wanted to take the whole notion of value a little bit further to suggest that it is possible that human beings start to get an existential sense of their own value that's not related to what other people think about them. So while mattering had been traditionally studied within the context of socially conferred value, for example, value that's dependent upon interpersonal relationships, we were interested in how people might perceive their own intrinsic value or how they might acquire a sense of their own ex existential mattering. George and Park in 2014 defined existential mattering as the degree to which individuals feel that their lives are of value and significance in the world, irrespective of what others think of them or how others regard or treat them. Now, we were interested in this in part also because of the great movement in the world associated with the Black Lives Matter movement. We were interested in the question, what do people mean when they say Black Lives Matter? What vision of mattering do they have in mind? What is the impact of the the, uh, the, the, the uh, affirmation that Black Lives Matter, what is the implications for, for Black men and women? Well, what do they think about this? What do the Europeans, what do the Chinese think about this, uh, this uh, phrase where they affirm that Black Lives Matter? So those, are the, those were the kinds of research that led us to um, um, the kind of uh, studies that we, uh, that we have been engaged in. I was going to share with you a study that we conducted some years ago in our lab involving children, but I think I won't do that because I think I'm talking a little bit too long. Uh, in our most recent process, what we did was we developed a qualitative study to try to get a sense for people's perception that their own lives matter because we were interested in the question, what are the implications of believing that my life matters for the way that I behave? For the way that I, for the way that my emotions and my mental health function. So we just started asking uh, young people. We had 57 participants, 44 females, and 12 males, males, 
simple questions. Do you think that you matter? We said we recognize that this is a broad question, so feel free to decide how you interpret this question, that there is no right answer. And then so we would record their answers. And then we would try to code their responses to this question. What is it that gives you the sense that you matter? Um, what happens if we take away all of the people in your life that it have made you uh, feel that you matter in the past? Would you still matter? What are some of the factors that lead you to believe uh, that, that, that you matter? And we found that there were, there were various dimensions of existential mattering. Sometimes people were uh, saying things about themselves. Some, sometimes they were saying things about their friends and family. Sometimes they were saying that their community. Sometimes they were saying that the universe itself gave them a, the sense that they mattered. Um, these were some of the interview questions. In every social source, in every social source of the sense that you matter, if every sort, I'm sorry, if every social source of the sense that you matter were erased from your life, what, if anything, might sustain you in the belief that your life matters? And so we were, we were asking them to tell us as much as possible about, about these things. In our early results, we found that what people said to us was that if they had acquired a sense of purpose, they were sure that they mattered. Sometimes they felt like they mattered because they had future goals and aspirations that they thought were worth pursuing. Sometimes they felt like they mattered because they could perceive that they had talents, traits, abilities, and strengths that they admired and that they thought were uh, worth cultivating. Sometimes subjects said to us that I matter because humanity as a species matters. And so they were interested in um, uh, developing their own lives in the hope that they could somehow help humanity as a species um, achieve greater success. Sometimes they would say that they just have a kind of an inner existential sense that they matter. It's almost as though they were perceiving something about themselves that they could not put into words, but they felt in their hearts. Sometimes they said that a sense of mattering came out of their view of the movement of history, that it seemed as though human life was going in a, di in a direction that suggested that, that, that human life matters and therefore my life matters. And then finally, sometimes they would say to us that um, uh, in their perception, existence itself seems to matter. And if existence itself seems to matter, then my own life matters. The next step in our, in our study is that we're going to try to look at uh, some of these um, um, ways of thinking in relationship to um, um, quantitative measures and in relationship to mental health and behavioral outcomes. Let me stop there and uh, open it up to questions or comments or uh, observations from the audience. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, this is a fascinating panel, and and I see what you mean about the thread that connects them together uh, very much. This whole question of of meaning and purpose runs through all three presentations, with really beauty being one of the driving forces by, behind purpose, in a sense. And um, uh, so I was very impressed by by this uh, connection. Uh, we have a few quest questions already in the chat. We don't have anything in the Q&A yet, but I do see a few things here in the chat. And let me see if I can find something here. Thomas says, what do you think is the role of volitional cap capacities in activating and sustaining the development of hopefulness? Not sure who that's directed to. I could say a word about it and then invite Professor Diesner also to share a word. Sure. What's really interesting about action is that when we perform an act that is congruent with our goals, the performance of the act itself gives us a greater degree of sense of agency or hopefulness. So acting itself is both a manifestation of hopefulness and a 
source of hopefulness. So for example, I'm a clinician and oftentimes if I'm treating somebody who's very depressed, I'll want them to come to my office. The very process of coming to my office uh, gives them a greater sense of agency or buoys their hopefulness. And so um, um, anytime we act on our aspirations, acting on our aspirations itself feeds our hopefulness. That's one simple response to that wonderful question. Hmm. Red, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> have a narcissistic moment. I began studying beauty 23 years ago when I heard uh, Dr. Penn give a lecture about hopefulness. And it was, it was, it was a challenging lecture because he was mentioning inner city kids in particular black kids often become hopeless by second grade. It's just like they, they don't see how school is going to make a difference in their life. And I was kind of horrified and I thought, well, what can bring up about hope? My very first study on beauty was looking at the relationship between beauty and hope. And, and, and as you might guess, uh, beauty does uh, inspire hope. In terms of volition, when you're feeling hopeful, volition is very important to actualize your hope. <laughs> and when you're feeling hopeless, right, then we need volition to what? Find some creative ways to bring hope back in our life possibly by going to see a psychologist and walking to his office so that we get that agency. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, Thomas says, also says, it seems to me that the increasing influence of social media into daily life crosses a red line in the person's self-concept of mattering. And I, and I do think that the, the whole issue of, of, of social media and mattering is a very interesting and important uh, topic. One of the things that the master says of himself that I think is absolutely beautiful, he says, this wanderer in the desert of God's love hath entered that city wherein neither the hand of praise nor blame can touch him. I think that the master says that in part to encourage us to disengage our own hearts from the opinions of others. We have to do the best that we can, but we cannot have our own confidence, our own sense of possibilities resting on the opinions of, of other human beings because the opinions of others can be grossly wrong about us or they can be mean-spirited. They can intend to actually defeat us. And so I think that one of the most important things for the time, for the age in which we're living, is to become increasingly detached from the opinions of others. Do you think that mattering is another way of saying recognizing your own beauty? <laughs> uh, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful insight, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's so true, right? I mean, we know from Kataba Agdas that uh, our whole approach to law and order is going to be transformed because of beauty, right? I mean, now people tend to follow laws because of reward and punishment. But Baha'u'llah says you're going to follow them out of a love for my beauty. That completely changes the entire structure of the universe, which relates, relates to uh, Philippe's question in uh, Q&A. Yes, right. we could have to re restructure the entire universe for mattering to uh, matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Philip does ask a specific question here, and maybe this is a good time for me to read it. And since the both of you know him, you can certainly give him a shout out as well. Uh, purpose, moral or spiritual development or beauty and mattering and development are individual trajectories very much affected by social contexts and the surrounding culture. What is the right interplay between the individual and the social order? What are the ideal conditions in which this interplay allows the individual to develop their inner and maybe unique and unknown potential? And what are the ideal conditions of interplay which would allow for the transformation of the existing social order? What does it mean if this interplay is not working properly and how can we respond to that? 
Sounds like we have an entire year's worth of webinars <laughs> laid out for us here. <laughs> and Philip, we'll have to have you back on in order to answer some of these questions yourself. <laughs> you know, part, part of the thought that I have about that question is um, two aspects. One has to do with protecting ourselves from cynicism. Mm -hmm. You know, cynicism is quite a corrosive and dangerous mindset. Uh, we, we, we doubt seriously the, the, the intentions of others. We doubt whether or not there's anything um, good to be appreciated in others. We start to look at life itself in a jaded way. And so we bring down our own spirits and interacting with others in that attitude causes them also to become despair. And so Adul Baha and the writings of our faith tell us that we should not lose confidence in the future of humanity. The future of humanity is bright and beautiful. And we have to embody in our own selves the qualities that bring hope to others. So courtesy being the prince of virtues, when you are interacting with somebody who's courteous, it looks, looks like a simple thing, but it serves a really important social function. And in an environment where people are angry and, and cold and unkind, when you show courtesy, when you show kindness, you can restore the hope and restore the confidence that human beings can be decent to one another, can be good, and therefore that humanity might have a future that is worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. That's a simple answer to mm -hmm. uh, Philippe's uh, really important question. Well, I, I'm going to go for even a more simple answer. Uh, when he says, what is the right interplay between the individual and the social order? I'd like to say it's 12% individual and 88% social order. This is the perfect interplay. Maybe it's 47. Maybe 47. Yeah. Oh, 42. Yeah. That's the difficulty, isn't it? This reminds me a bit of, was it Walden 2? where they, the author talked about how they don't say thank you because it's really a socially unnecessary thing to say. I remember by slight reading of that book. So, Michael, your, your comment really is quite a critique on that particular approach to social structure. <laughs> uh, we have another question here um, from uh, Jeannot. Has any neurological research looked into the development of the brain in children? who have and have not been explicitly taught or trained, instructed in the cultivation of virtues as values. Given that different values or virtues, such as gratitude, compassion, et cetera, trigger different areas of the brain, one would think that brain development would differentiate uh, in the response to this stimulus in a way that might have a com compounding effect that might be measurable statistically, such as in IQ scores. Any thoughts? Well, I don't know of any direct research that's like actually compared the two. <clears throat> There's certainly uh, children that have had, uh, I mean, to be not explicitly taught values uh, would be difficult, of course, to find uh, yeah, people, uh, specifically, and there would be a, such a, a gradient there. Uh, but I think uh, the, the overall uh, second part of the question is that uh, yes, uh, I'm quite sure we could uh, differentiate brains on fMRI uh, between, uh, I lost the question. <laughs> yeah, I just went away, uh, but uh, she was interested in, in uh, yeah, what were the two different things that you could find in, in uh, the brain encouragement and something else? I can't remember now, yeah. Sorry, guys, it's in the answered tab. If you just switch over there just a second. Ah, okay. Uh, brain development differential response oh, to the stimulus and it may have a compounding effect that could be measurable. Uh, well, I think your intuition is totally correct. Uh, I think that if we uh, would definitely 
are at least in the future would be able to measure the difference between uh, brains that are uh, very activated by virtues and brains that are not. We, I, I would just add that for heuristic purposes, it's useful to distinguish between different kinds of emotions, right? So there are some emotions that you might call physical emotions. Some emotions are psychological. Some emotions are moral. And some emotions are spiritual. And we know that the cultivation of the capacity to experience different emotions is conditional upon certain kinds of treatment or certain kinds of experiences. So, for example, the development, the healthy development of the limbic system is critical for the development of certain kinds of social emotions. And the limbic system drives the development also of the medial prefrontal cortex, which is a system that, that Professor Diesner spoke about. And the medial prefrontal cortex is connected to the, the, uh, the neocortex, the, the frontal cortex. And so if you're going to experience something like beauty, the beauty of an idea, the beauty of nature, the beauty of a way of life, what you have to develop is you have to develop the physical capacities and also the intellectual capacities that drive our capacities to perceive abstract phenomena in the world. And so it, 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 it may well be that without certain kinds of neurocortical development, we can't have certain kinds of experiences. And that's why early social learning and early social relationships turn out to be really important also for later spiritual development. And uh, we, should not, we should not neglect that. And I think that so much of the emphasis in the writings on the way that we treat children and infants mm -hmm. is, is so that we can prepare them uh, to, to, to experience the more ethereal dimensions of, of life. No doubt this relates a little bit to the whole issue of autism, too, since those are people with certain restrictions in their social uh, capacities, I suppose. There must be brain studies of that, I would think. Is there any, can you, do, do you know anything about, about that whole question of, of um, research on autism? There, there is a great deal of research in that area. But, you know, we mustn't um, group all autistic children in one box, right? Because it's a very, very complex um, spectrum of, of, of disorders. And, and uh, many autistic children are exquisitely sensitive. I have, in fact, an autistic grandson who is so sensitive to his grandmother's love hmm. that it's astounding. I mean, he, he, he feels her love so manifestly that you can see that it brings joy to his heart to be even in the orbit of her presence. So although he has some social, some difficulties with social relationships, his heart, his spirit, his mm -hmm. soul is keenly sensitive to, uh, to, to the love that she has for him. And I think that this is true of many children who, who, who also suffer from autism. Mm -hmm. There's also a question here about your research on Black Lives Matter and on African-American children. Do you have any other comments you can make about that? Yes, we're just really beginning this research. And so over the course of the next couple of years, we will be, uh, we'll be studying this very carefully. I'm reticent to say anything about it at such an early stage because we're just starting to collect uh, collect data we haven't done any uh, we haven't done enough data collection to be able to say anything um reasonable or intelligent or informed by observations well we'll have to have you back in another few years perhaps when there's some research to present that would be quite interesting uh janitor jano i'm not quite sure how she pronounces her first name also mentions the steiner waldorf cur curricula versus any other educational systems and i guess that's a question of of their effect on child development though i'm not quite sure here you have any comment about that void wants to answer it <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, the little I know about Waldorf schools <clears throat> is I wish my children and grandchildren could attend them. <laughs> uh, 
uh, the, the kind of teachers that are attracted to it, the kind of curriculum that, you know, lifts your potential. It's really wonderful. About 15 years ago, a, a principal from a Waldorf school in Germany used to write to me about infusing more higher levels of beauty into his particular school. Huh. Which of course, endeared me even more to the Waldorf approach. I don't see any other questions right off hand well, that's wonderful that's perfect because i actually have to go <laughs> <laughs> so the timing couldn't be better but that's i'm so grateful for the chance to to spend time with professor diesner and and you also uh rob stockman and and uh and jenny well, and also i want to thank everyone very much for attending today thank both Michael and Rhett for being able to be here and Jenny for being able to record something for us. And I look forward to seeing everybody. I hope next week when we hear more about Shogi Effendi from the point of view of uh, Laura Clifford Barney. And then the week after when we hear about uh, the economic implications of the law of Hukukula. So from the point of view of the Wilmot Institute, I want to thank everyone for attending and wish you all a good weekend. Bye-bye. <music>